everyone. Hello, hello. Hopefully you enjoyed some frosting earlier today and some Cine Sweeties from Cinnabon. Uh, as you heard, I'm the group president of Focus Brands, uh, but most recently was the president of Cinnabon, the disturbingly delicious cinnamon roll company that brings sweet treats uh, all over the world. And so I want to share with you a few lessons from pretty unexpected places, and they're lessons from my villages, my, my home, my mother, my family, working at Hooters restaurants for 16 years, and that was an interesting village <laughs> to be a part of, uh, being in the restaurant and global franchising industry, and then very literally from the villages of Somali, Ethiopia, and Rwanda. And you may wonder what those very weird, seemingly disparate things have in common, but they have a lot in common. Uh, they have leadership lessons in common, they have life lessons in common, they have personal lessons in common. And so I think most of you have the app, so feel free to type in questions throughout. So think about you anytime you're leading your family, your job, you're leading yourself, decisions for yourself. My mom was faced with an incredibly difficult decision. And that difficult decision was to leave the comfort, you just heard about not being comfortable, to leave the comfort of that situation. My father, while he was an alcoholic and a bad father and husband, he had a good job. And on both sides of my family, literally everyone lived in trailer parks. Interesting lesson in life that at some point, if you're the leader, no matter how young you are, if you're in the position of leadership, you got to make the call that's right for you and right for your family or your friends or your community or your school or your work or whatever it is. When my mom told me that when I was nine, second lesson that I've taken with me in business and every company I have built, every team I've led, every uh, enterprise I've turned around, the second lesson is that when she told me that when I was nine years old, when she said, that's it, I'm done, we're leaving, I did not cry, I did not get upset. At the age of nine, I looked at her and said, what took you so long? At the age of nine. The lesson in that is that the people in any situation who are closest to the action, so if it's business, it's the employees that are closest to the transaction. If it's community or family, it's the people who are in that situation the most. Those people know what the right thing to do is long before the leader does. You know this. You know this in your school, in your class, in your work. You know what's happening every day. And you might not have the experience or the skills to articulate the solution. And you might not have the authority to make the call that creates the change. But you know deep down that a change is needed. But a leader is necessary to draw that out of you, come up with a solution that's scalable and sustainable, and then make the change. So the lesson in life and in business is that if you're scared to make a decision, if you're overthinking something, if you're kind of freaking out about what job to take or, what, or to quit or not to quit or to move or not to move, talk to as many people as you can that are in a similar situation and you will get the courage to do the right thing for the right reasons. The people closest to the action always know what the right thing to do is. So my next lesson from that village of my family is stop whining, stop complaining, figure it out and make it happen. Don't wait for somebody to bring you a solution. Just try stuff. And if it doesn't work, you're that much closer to the next solution. But I learned that from watching my mom. The lessons are around you, whether they're good or bad, constantly in life. I started out uh, working at Hooters in high school as a senior. I got into college, first person on either side of my family to get into college. I started college at the age of 18. I was an electrical engineering major and a, a computer sciences major and a, a studies, a women's studies minor. I was going to blow it out of the water. I wanted to be an attorney for DuPont Chemicals. I wanted to get an engineering degree and then go get my law degree because my teachers told me I talked a lot and I should be a great attorney one day. And I was really good at math. And so those were the things put together. I had a dream of being an attorney for DuPont Chemicals. That's what I thought I would be doing. Although I believe very much in planning. I believe in setting goals. I also believe that not wanting to be stuck where you are today, tomorrow, and the next day is also a really powerful fire under your butt if you let it. And that was my motivator. So I went to school, straight A student, still working at Hooters. When I was 18, I became a Hooters girl, started slinging wings and serving beer and having a good time and making great tips. And it was a really fun job, but it was always nothing more than that. It was a fun part-time job that I ended up working full-time to pay my way through school. And then a few things happened when I was 19, my second year in college. Uh, one, all the kitchen employees quit one shift. If you've ever worked in a restaurant, if you're a server, it's kind of a problem if all the people who are making the food exit the facility. It was that shift that I realized that I love these lists where people say, there's two types of people in the world. 
Um, there are lots of those lists, but at that moment, I created my own version of two types of people in the world. The two types of people in the world are when the shit hits the fan, there's one group of people who stand there and go, what do we do? And then there's a group of people that go, I'm going to try something. That's it. And it's like the seas part, and those two types of people emerge from the bodies of those that are around you. There's three reasons I jumped in the kitchen that day. One was self-serving. If the bills didn't get paid, the checks at the table, I wouldn't get tips and I couldn't pay my bills. So I had a very selfish driver for figuring out how to make things work. Second was I was just curious to see if I could figure it out. I'm like, I wonder if I can go back there and do that because I only knew enough to be dangerous. The third reason was because I actually genuinely wanted to be helpful. There were people who worked on that shift that were using that job as the sole revenue source to pay for their family. That was their only job. And so to me, it was a problem if I get, didn't get tips. To them, it was detrimental if they didn't get the tips on that shift. And so it was this desire to both self-preserve, be helpful, but also solve my curiosity that caused me to jump in the back that shift. By the end of several months, I had worked every job in that restaurant and unknowingly built a resume that set me up for my next sort of life-changing opportunity. So none of those things, I didn't do any of them for a life-changing opportunity. I did them to be curious and solve the curiosity, to be helpful, and to self-preserve. Fast forward, I get a phone call from the corporate office of Hooters Restaurants in Atlanta, Georgia, down to Jacksonville uh, with my general manager, and they said, hey, great news, we're opening the first ever Hooters restaurant in Sydney, Australia, and we need 10 really great employees to go down and train the new employees down there. We think you should be one of them because you know every job in the restaurant. I'm 19 years old. I had never been on a plane. I grew up in like redneck Jacksonville, Florida. Not only had I no travel experience, I had not been out of the country, and I didn't have a passport. So there was kind of a barrier to saying yes and that I could not legally exit the country. I needed to get a passport, and we realized I could fly to Miami that next day, stand in line with all my paperwork, use an expediter service, and get a passport in 24 hours. So I booked my first ever flight to Miami from Jacksonville, flew to Miami, stood in line, got my passport, flew back. They never knew. But I and it worked out, and so that was the first time that I learned in my life, you can be rewarded for saying yes without being 100% ready, as long as you have the hustle muscle to figure it out. Don't say yes if you don't have the hustle muscle to figure it out between now and when you need to deliver. But don't wait until you're 100% ready. If I had waited until I had a passport, if that wasn't reason enough to get one, what would have been? I had to make up my classes that I missed, of course. Uh, I did that with no problem. And I thought, you know, that was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Who's ever going to ask a 19-year-old, child of an alcoholic, child of a single parent that's worked at Hooters restaurants to go do stuff like this? And if they ever did, it won't be anytime soon. 30 days later, I got asked to go open the first ever Hooters restaurants in Central America in Insurgentes in Zona Rosa in Mexico City. At the age of 20, I had launched the franchise on three continents outside of North America while still in college. Dope, right? Like, so cool. Look for growth in companies. That could mean tiny and growing, or it could be big and changing. So that was one. Second was I had the courage to take the chance and fail fast. So it was my courage that contributed to that. But third, I joined a company with really cool people that were obviously willing to give me a shot. That is the beauty of, at a young age, putting yourself in a position to have to do the same thing with different people in different places over and over again. You learn how to build trust quickly. You learn how to be vulnerable and accessible. You learn it's a brutal mirror. When you're with a new person every day, their reaction to you is a brutal mirror to what you're great at and what you aren't great at. Most people are either so humble and so gracious that they're saying, who am I to ask a question? Who am I to challenge? Who am I to go over there? That's an important characteristic. Humility and, and graciousness and gratefulness are key attributes in being just an awesome human. But if you do it solely and you don't balance it with courage and confidence, you'll never go anywhere. And by the way, people will not want to follow you. Courage doesn't have to be boldness and rudeness and bull in a china shop. Confidence doesn't have to show up that way. It does mean standing up for your values. It does mean asking smart questions when you're being thoughtful. And when you balance those things like I did in these countries over time, you figure out a way to win with a different team over and over. And, and not only does that build your reputation, it builds your confidence. Because then if I could figure this out in four different countries with four different teams, here's one thing I know. I know how to figure it out. I never wonder 
is it them or is it me? I learned how much was me, and I learned what I need from my team. So I encourage you to find a way, if you are trying to learn how to speak or how to run a P&L or build marketing initiatives or play a sport, whatever it is, do it with a different team in a short amount of time. You will get better faster than almost anyone else if you're paying attention. When you get criticism, for one second, take the opportunity to entertain the possibility that they might be right. Any criticism. Somebody says, you're too this, you're too that, you're not enough this. Take for a second and think, are they right? Because by the way, they might be. But the second thought is, what can I do about it even if they are? But I will tell you, you have to be at a point in your life as often as you can where your pride in what you are a part of and your gratitude for what you have the opportunities to do exceed your concern over what others think of you. You have to be in that space. And you're not always going to be there. I'm not always there. Sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm not so proud of this. I need to fix it. Or I don't know that I'm feeling so grateful today. But the, the more both proud and grateful you are, the more resolute you will be in your decisions. The faster you'll make decisions, the less you'll ho-hum over things that people sort of put in front of you. And the biggest mistakes I've made in my personal life and my professional life, in business, in nonprofits that I lead, in the startups that I invest in, is not making decisions fast enough and not following my gut. But I had no idea how applicable the nonprofit NGO village lessons would be to literally every part of my life. And, and one of the biggest lessons that I will give you is to focus on things that are small enough to change, but big enough to matter. How can you justify passing up helping this life for the next? And this is a lesson in limited resources. In your personal life and in your business, you only have so much fill in the blank. Time, energy, love, resources, money. You only have so much. I don't care how big you are, how wealthy you are, how great you are. You still only have so much. The trick in life is investing your resources, your time, your money, your energy, your love, your attention, whatever it is, in the most important things that provide the greatest return on that effort. But I can't snap my fingers and change it. It doesn't mean that's not my dream. It means that I have the dream for the big win, the big goal, but I'm going to get comfortable with small wins that build my way to that change. By focusing on the right thing, we affected everything. If we had focused on either of the other two because of the emotional pull to either have the biggest win or to not walk over the small opportunity, we would have actually affected nothing. Small enough to change, but big enough to matter. Big enough to matter is about the greatest return on your time and your effort and your money and your resources. But small enough to change is about understanding there are some things that are bigger than you. Sir. A mentor provides you perspective and guidance and all the things the panel told you were so right on. They tell you their life stories, their mistakes. You, you live another life through their experience, but a sponsor and an advocate is someone who's willing to put their name on you. And if they're not willing to put their name on you, you need to find out why. Is it because you're doing something that them putting their name on you puts their reputation at risk? Because they've worked really hard to be where they're at. Or is there something else that they don't know about you where you could bring that to light as maybe a new qualification or something you have experience in doing that they don't know? I think who you know is meaningless unless you have a meaningful relationship. So I like to reframe it and say it's not about what you know or who you know, it's about what you know about who you know. <laughs> Ooh, and more I'm importantly, going. that's a good one. More importantly, it's about what they know about you. Just because you know them doesn't mean squat. I know a lot of people. I can reach out to a lot of people, but have I done anything for them that makes them want to reciprocate? Have I done anything that's gotten on their radar as meaningful or helpful to if them? You have to rely on your resume alone, you are in trouble. You will miss out on great opportunities, but if you do really good work for the right reasons, being curious and helpful all through your life, over time, that reputation precedes you, and the levels of connections that happen in the universe, that happen in the industry, are so far beyond what you could ever have if you just do your job. Communication is not about speaking, it's about being heard. And so you really have to think about how does your personality come across, and what are the ways that you are okay with speaking in a little bit lower cadence. It doesn't mean changing who you are, but I absolutely believe in turning up your personality a bit when the situation is appropriate, and turning it down a little bit when the situation is appropriate because it's not all about me being me. It's about me getting the work done while still being me. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you guys very much.
Another round of applause for Cat Court. Thank you so much. Thank you.